uh, presentation from our, uh, our, our, our chief of police. Um, so you want to take it away? Thank you, Tim, and uh, everyone uh, for the opportunity to present uh, this evening. Um, I'm David Ballinger, the police chief here, and uh, along with me on the on the line here is my budget manager, Robert Carroll. Um, by way of introduction, since we went around the table, I've been with the city for 30 years. Uh, my experience in Santa Ana extends beyond 51 years. Uh, so I have been asked to um, present um, an update on the impact of Measure X on, on police services. I don't know who's controlling uh, this PowerPoint. Kristen, is it? Yeah, we'll, we'll do it here. If you want to okay. just tell us when to advance. Okay. Do you want to advance? Maybe you put it into PowerPoint mode. There you go. Um, put it down at the bottom there. The thing that almost looks like a cup. Where you can hit F5. Oh, one moment. That work? F5. At, at the school, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> you showed your age. <laughs> one moment. We're having a little bit of technical difficulty here. Morris. So, it, can you advance? Beautiful. It? Can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So let me let me first start off uh, by uh, restating um, in part the purpose of, of Measure X, and that's uh, to maintain effective 911 uh, response uh, or emergency response, as it were, retaining firefighters and police officers, addressing homelessness, fixing streets, maintaining parks, youth, and senior services, uh, and unrestricted general revenue purposes. Uh, and so that's that's um, directly from, from the measure as, as titled. So back in uh, on September 11th, the police department did in fact uh, present uh, to this committee and identified two primary goals. First, to improve uh, police officer hiring and retention, and then the second, to reduce response times to calls or service. Uh, go ahead and switch. So, uh, on, on the first one, um, a little bit of background uh, beyond the slide. Uh, uh, we're recruiting um, highly qualified police officers, and that's that's all we're looking for here. Um, is is a uh, task, and when we elevate the standards, which in fact is what we did back in 2017, um, it's even that much more difficult. So the historical is we found ourselves um, hiring some positions and we really could not keep up with attrition. So, you know, you hire 20 or 30, but 25, 35 leap in that same calendar year. So your net gain is, is, is not much. Um, so that we went through that kind of a, a yo-yo effect for quite some time. So in 2018, uh, what we did was uh, really reset um, the recruitment um, strategy um, strategic plan, comprehensive, uh, reset the command staff and that oversees that function as well. Um, and we uh, went into areas that we had not uh, before, um, as simple as overlooking our, our community college in our, in our backyard. Um, I'm a product of that institution, and so I know that there are young people there that um, have questions and, and maybe are interested in exploring, not even necessarily being a police officer, but, but any any opportunity in the police department. So we sent people into the hallways uh, of, of the campus to have general conversations. Of course, we did all the traditional recruitment events and that, military institutions. Um, and then we embarked on a branding um, uh, initiative. Uh, we tied that into a five-year strategic plan. Um, the goal number five is, in fact, to recruit, brand, and succession plan our police department. Uh, uh, again, that was part of the background. Uh, when I took over as the chief in 2017, I inherited 67 police officer vacancies, 67%. Uh, that is uh, significant for, for, our, for our city and, and the, the operational tempo at which we uh, respond to. Uh, and so reset uh, got 
that strategy, uh, put a plan in place. So that pretty much took all of, of 18 and, and really 19, uh, we, we really got to, to work, establish the goal of hiring 50 police officers in calendar year 2019. Uh, I will tell you that uh, I researched uh, records at, at City Hall, City personnel, and they only go back 20 years, uh, but we have not hired 50 police officers in over 20 years in one calendar year uh, in the city. So we achieved that goal. Go ahead and switch. Uh, 2019, uh, you see 50 police officers hired. It's broken down by uh, recruits. These are these are uh, candidates that have to actually have to go to a six and a half month academy before we actually see them back at the police department to get into the training phase. And then uh, lateral police officers, we hired ten of those. Um, they come from other police agencies and they can go directly into the uh, training program. And then one academy grad. Uh, and that would have consisted of uh, someone who had either put themselves in the academy or were with another agency, uh, and for whatever reason, a separated deployment there, and then we picked them up. Um, so in, in that same year, we had um, 11 police officers of uh, separate employment, retirement, um, and, and other reasons. And so our net increase, you see, is 39. Uh, that becomes relevant here in the, in the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. So uh, the table here shows an illustration of, of a seven-year history here, uh, and and you see uh, that um, you know as I was mentioning over over the years, uh, it really just came down to how many how many officers you hired, and then actually how many separated employment. We did have a, a, a lower year um, in 2019, as you see, there was only 11 that separated. Um, and so you may ask yourself, well, why, why is that? Um, it has to do with hiring cycles, age of, of our workforce, um, and then uh, retention uh, as well. Uh, there is a, a typo on this slide I'll draw your attention to. Uh, it was collected, submitted, and for whatever reason uh, could not be uploaded. Uh, from 2014 to 2018, that's, that's really 18, not 19. The net gain when you back out all of the separations was five. Uh, so, so for four years there, we really only saw five additional police officers out of the roadway. Fast forward to 2019, backing out the 11 that separated employment, we saw an increase of 39. Slide, please. The other goal uh, is the reduction of uh, response times to our uh, priority calls for service. This is um, the, the highest priority uh, that was identified in our strategic plan. Um, the strategic plan is available on the website at a couple different points, the police department website. Um, it's, I, I draw your attention there. Uh, it's, it's the first time that we actually went out to the community and, and got input from community members um, and incorporated those into our strategic plan, uh, uh, co-facilitated uh, along with the Orange County Human Relations Commission. Okay, so next slide, please. So response times, uh, we have five different uh, priority levels uh, that are identified. Uh, that are categorized based on the information that our dispatch receives, and then uh, dispatches uh, officers accordingly. The first one is priority one, is the highest priority, is immediate threat uh, to life. Um, and then priority two is uh, threatens the safety of citizens or, uh, or serious crimes that are in progress or have just occurred, uh, urgent in nature. nature. Priority one and two calls are dispatched uh, uh, immediately uh, to any available unit. We do have four policing districts, but these calls, uh, really the dispatcher is uh, expected to uh, find any available unit in the city and begin to dispatch them. Next slide. Uh, the next three priorities are, uh, in fact, lower priorities, as, as you read there. Um, all the way down to number five, which is lowest priority, non-urgent, administrative in nature, parking problems, et cetera. Um, I, I will add that uh, 
obviously during this unprecedented pandemic uh, that, that really, um, um, well, it started in 2019, but really um, as we began to um, deal with it here uh, locally in March, so for the, for the past seven months of, of 2020, we have been operating under this um, additional uh, requirement for CDC guidelines, uh, making sure that we keep our workforce safe. And so um, on priority number four and five calls for service, uh, for example, whenever possible, uh, we did shift uh, to um, handling those uh, over the phone, if, if possible, uh, online uh, reporting as well. So it was an alternative uh, police response. Uh, because we still very much need to be present and handle all those 911 calls for service. Um, we receive on average about 13,000 calls uh, for service per month. And so uh, when you compare that to other cities, we're, we are extremely busy. Um, but again, with, with COVID, we did have to make uh, adjustments. I will also share with this group uh, that uh, probably uh, when many police departments here uh, in our county and, and across the region and the country, uh, pulled resources inward uh, and away from the community, um, we did the opposite. And so uh, what does that mean? So uh, if you recall when, when the pandemic first hit um, and we had to make all you know, adjustments on the immediate shutdown, um, uh, various departments uh, sent all of the detectives home to work from home completely. And uh, they split their department in half. And we only had half of what was previously assigned to frontline policing at any given time. Um, the other thing that occurred was uh, various departments were directed to not engage in proactive enforcement. So imagine that for a moment. Uh, you have uh, police executives uh, directing their, their, their department to not proactively engage uh, in providing public safety. Right. You're still responding to 911 calls, but you're not actively looking to respond to, mitigate, and in some instances, prevent uh, crime, specifically violent crime. That's not what occurred here in our city. Uh, next slide. So response times, um, you'll see here, uh, and we are still uh, currently in, in a uh, assessment uh, phase looking at our five response uh, priorities and looking to see where we can make adjustments. What has happened across the country also is um, some of the uh, shifts and changes in policing um, we may find may be permanent, uh, even as we come out of this pandemic uh, next year sometime, hopefully, or sooner. Um, but what you see here is a, a reduction in um, response times overall, 24%. Uh, uh, you see it broken down here by priority. Uh, average from 2018, 2019, and year to date in 2020. So in 2018, your 911 um, life in immediate danger on average was about eight minutes, 11 seconds. Uh, fast forward, uh, we're at six minutes, five, uh, six, six minutes, five seconds uh, on the response. Um, now, part of this also factors in that early on in the pandemic, a lot less cars on the roadway. And so we were able to get from point A to point B much quicker. Um, but we, we evaluate these response times um, on a weekly basis and then on a monthly basis, and, and they, have, they have stayed pretty pretty steady and, and they trended uh, uh, pretty consistently. So we'll continue to monitor this and see if any other changes need to be made. Uh, direct correlation here um, with the support of Measure X to uh, staff the police department appropriately. Um, next slide. So that's it, I guess. Um, I, I will um, take uh, any questions. And, and again, uh, Robert uh, Carroll, who's my budget manager, is on is on the line as well. Excellent. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Chief Valentine, for that uh, um, that uh, that update, um, especially with regards to response times and. And so on and so forth. Um, at this time, um, if you're okay on taking some questions, I'm uh, assuming that uh, we might have some questions for possibly the chief and or um, the uh, finance staff. So um, let's go ahead and open it up to uh, the members of the 
Would you like to uh, ask a question for two or three? This, this is uh, Commissioner Leo, uh, good evening, Chief. Um, How are you doing, Chris? Good. Um, two questions. Uh, the first one is one of the questions that came up when um, when your staff came and presented the first time was we grappled with a standard response time and what the goal was to get to. Mm -hmm. And it's an open question for you is, is there a standard time that you're looking for? And if you are able to hire additional officers, could you get to that standard? That's Great one question. question. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That, that, that's one question. The second question is, we hear a lot about the fact that for a city our size, we have, we have less police per capita than other cities. And I'm wondering if you can answer that question. I, I've heard us compared to L.A., I've heard us compared to other cities. If you can answer those two questions for me, that'd be great. Absolutely. Thanks for the questions. Uh, so, so standard... Uh, in policing and, and response times. There, there is no uh, hard and fast uh, time um, established. Um, it's, we want to, we strive to get to a particularly 911, a highest priority calls as quickly as possible. So it's six minutes, just over six minutes right now. We want to get to five. We get to five, we want to get to four, uh, and so on. Every, every second, it goes by when we're talking about a 911 threat to life is significant and, and it can mean the difference between life and death. Um, so, so there's no, there's no hard and fast standard time. We want to lower that as much as possible and continue to drive in that direction. Um, there are staffing models, uh, that agencies, uh, throughout the country uh, look at and you essentially um, enter various uh, variables uh, that can be set by community members, by this group, by, by uh, police staff, and saying what what is what is a reasonable time? What, what is what is our what is our target? Let's say five minutes. So what will it take uh, to get to that priority one call in five minutes in most every instance? And then you um, enter data such as um, you know the population of our city, the miles, the square miles. Uh, time of day, uh, all these factors and out um, comes a equation as to how many officers you would need to meet that goal. There, there are those uh, metrics that various universities um, uh, partner with police agencies uh, to to do, and so so that's available. But but always, um, you know, from my perspective, is is uh, we've lowered it. We want to continue to lower it, right? So, so that's 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 a um, so so the second question, great question again. Uh, so we the there's a there's a metric that is used, and that's the Western states, um, which is California, Nevada, Arizona, all the Western states. The average of, of those states is 1.8 police officer per thousand. 1.8, right? So prior to um, you know, this huge recruitment effort when we were at, you know, 67 vacancies, we were in the area of about 0.08 per thousand in the city, half of what we should be at, right? So fast forward, uh, we're, we're up to uh, 366 uh, officers today. Um, we were hovering at about 1.1, 1.2. The 1.8 ratio, if you uh, extrapolate that to our documented residents in, in our city, you know, I think the last time I checked, we were north of like 600 officers uh, on that on that staffing model. So LAPD, you mentioned, um, they're, uh, if they're not north of 2.0 officers per thousand, they're pretty darn near. So we, we're, we're, we're very lean um, and, and uh, we... Uh, are able to accomplish, you know, the policing mission. If we had additional officers, then obviously we could do more and lower those response times. Thank you. Yes, sir. Member Karagosian here. I do have one question. Um, since retention was one of the goals of the 
measure it. I was wondering where we are compared to other agencies in Orange County on the salaries and benefits scale, and if we are still at risk of our officers leaving to go to other agencies, or if um, we're in the higher part of the scale and can retain them. Yes, thank you, Lord. I really appreciate that question. Another, another great question. Um, so uh, we, we are currently at the, at the higher um, um, level uh, in terms of uh, paying compensation. Um, when you compare to other agencies like size, um, uh, population, activity level, uh, when you take into effect all those, all those factors. But, you know, I, I will say um, uh, pay and, and, and benefits is, is, is just one factor, right? It's also about uh, the standing of the organization, the, the organizational tempo, um, and, and the reputation of, of the agency. So I mentioned uh, in 2017 when I took over, you know, with, with a, you know, excess of 14% vacancy rate in the sworn ranks alone, you know, you could go to a, a low call, and this is where officers get together before they actually go out in the street, and there would be six police officers, you know, six police officers for the city on, on a cover watch. It's just entirely unacceptable. That affects morale, right? So fast forward uh, with the hiring uh, that is supported um, and and um, leadership. Uh, I, I, I can't overstate you know, the importance of, of good, sound leadership and holding officers accountable and supporting officers, which is what we do today. Um, we're not at risk of, of a retention uh, factor or concern. In fact, um, we have more highly qualified candidates and positions available at this point. That is not the case with many agencies, even in Orange County, but certainly beyond uh, across the country. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent, Chief. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna step in here. This is a this is Sam, and uh, I, have, I have a couple of, couple more data driven questions. And then uh, a couple, couple of philosophical ones, but I'm going to hit you up with the, uh, the data ones first. Um, you you kind of mentioned that, um, you know, obviously it's a, always a struggle between the, the recruiting and then the, the separation. Um, and with, with regards to our, our, our age of our, of our force, um, mm -hmm. is, what, what is our average age, um, you know, maybe if you have an idea um, of what the average age is now versus the average age a few years ago, um, trying to, and where I'm going with that is, you know, are you anticipating, um, you know, separation being a larger and larger issue going forward also? Yes, thank you so, for the question. Uh, so we, we do have a, a very young workforce, uh, particularly uh, in the frontline policing area, and that's true across the industry. Uh, we do look at, um, you know, the really the, the metric there would be the age of our police officers and then their years of service. So if you're getting near the age of 50 for those classic uh, um, retirement uh, officers, and then if you're near 30 years of service, that's usually the, the, the two for combination in terms of when people are, are looking at retiring. So we, we take a look at that um, regularly. Um, this next year, this 2020, this is now, you know, this is pre-COVID, uh, we'll have to see what that factor looks like uh, in an overlay. We were uh, estimating, again, really a, a lower number, 15 to 20 or so. That's a, just a, a really a guesstimate because it's also a hard data point to to uh, obtain and validate, right? Because we actually have to ask, you know, volunteer information when it comes to this. We have to ask, ask officers in the next year, in the next three years, you know, 36 months, in the next whatever it is, are, are you planning on retiring? Yes or no. That's a, and, you know, people sometimes aren't willing to offer that information for, for whatever reason. It's, it's personal to them, and that's okay. So we look at age and then time on the job. And, and what it tells us is, again, uh, really uh, not much of a concern there when it comes to uh, retention and a mass exodus. I will say that because of everything, all the factors that are impacting policing today uh, and moving forward, that is a factor. Yeah, that is a huge factor in other communities, uh, not here. Um, and, and I think it's because of the work that we've uh, put in uh, on the front end, and uh, again with 
with support uh, from from the city uh, it has brought us to to where we are today. Okay, uh, very good. And um, you know, look, from looking at your table B, which is the uh, the seven year hiring um, issue. Um, so you know, we kind of you know the big number that we, we everyone you know kind of knew about and you were striving for was that 50, 50 hires. And so we're at net 39 or 19, net 8, so 47. Um, so do we still, do we have, uh, maybe in my terminology, three um, funded yet unfilled positions that you're still trying to hire for? Or is it more? Or is it frozen because of COVID at those levels right now? Um, so, kind of yeah, so there's, there's no, there's no uh, uh, freezing uh, uh, of police officer positions, if anyways. Uh, they're all with others. Uh, we, we are we are uh, funded to 366 uh, police officer positions. Uh, that's that's what we are funded to. And so we, um, in fact, I have a swearing-in ceremony uh, Monday, uh, this Monday coming up, uh, for three officers, and that that brings us to 366. Okay. Um, and, and then in, in addition to that, uh, this past uh, year we were. Um, awarded a um, Department of Justice COPS hiring grant. We have been out of that um, award cycle for four years, and so uh, we were able to secure uh, 10 additional police officer positions uh, through the hiring grant, of course, with the match by the city. So those are the positions now that we're focusing on hiring moving forward, and again, continuing to uh, meet our attrition rates at the same time. Okay, so I'm going to restate that in, in my, my terms and hopefully I uh, wrote down right. So we're at the 366, you know, starting on Monday, which is the, but then there's an, an additional 10 through a grant that you're still um, seeking out. It might be specialized people, but um, or specialized officers, but there's another 10 that um, hopefully you, you'll be looking to fill. Is that right? Yeah. The, the right. 10, um, the, the authorization for those 10 is secure. It's confirmed. So now we need to, as we move forward, hire hire those positions. And they won't all be hired overnight, obviously. Sure. But but we have a, a strategy in place and and uh, to hire those positions as well. So we'll be at three seventy six, right? Okay. okay. Yeah. Um. In in terms of uh, well, how, how long are those? Um, I mean, usually with grants, those only last for you know, a certain time. Certain Is, are those like one year funding positions, two years? So we, Robert. Can you uh, chime in here on on our, we have to hire them for the period and then how much longer we have to keep them? Of course, we're not going to let them go. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, well, it's a three-year grant, so uh, the grant will fund them for the uh, first three years, and then after the grant ends, we have to keep them for an additional year. That's and right. As the chief mentioned, uh, we'll have no plans on uh, on uh, letting any of these guys go. They'll be, they'll be employed as, as long as... Uh, as long as we can, definitely. Okay, so essentially we have three years of, of grant money and then and then we're funding internally um, through the city. Okay. Um, and then in terms of uh, switching over to response time, Chief, um, so and this is you know, very encouraging on, on, on the response time. Congratulations on that. Um, you know, I, I think as, as member Leo um, was implying, you know, I think most of us are kind of in positions that we kind of you know, put out a, especially a lot of us that are in finance, you know, we put a, a raw number out trying to achieve, but that's just not how policing works, is that you're always trying to get better, but there's not, like, a, an internal, like, goal of, hey, guys, if we get this, then we met our goal for this year. Well, uh, so in terms of a response time, as I, right. as I mentioned, we're, we're priority one year-to-date. On average, we're at 605. So if we establish, you know, 5.30 is our response time, we, we, we can always set goals and, and obviously work towards those. Um, this, um, this, this is a, a also, once again, a, a unique uh, piece because of the pandemic. Um, we, we don't know. We simply don't know. And even with this, you know, this, this measurable metric uh, studies that, that we can access and engage in, they, they, they cannot tell you today that, um, you know, what the true impact will be of the pandemic when it comes to traffic on the roadway, um, urgency calls for service, domestic violence that occurs at an increasing rate at homes, et cetera. 
all those factors. Um, to answer your question, um, you know, our, our goal would, would be to drive each and every one of these priority uh, response times uh, down. That, that's, that's our goal. Okay. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Um, and then you mentioned alternative um, police responses, such as uh, employment internet reports, um, <laughs> I think on probably priority four um, type, uh, type calls. How, 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 is, how does, does that come into play in terms of response plans? You yeah. might have a, you know, like I get spoken into in a call, you know, I get pushed to the, um, to the internet, you know, to make the online report. Right. How, how does something like that come into play in response time? So, um, if, if, for example, we have a burglary, uh, it's a, and it's a cold call. In other words, it occurred some time ago from, from discovery to actually notifying the police department, and there's no um, suspect information that is known uh, at the time, rather than have that call pinned in our queue, because um, that, that tolls, right? All that time is tolling, and it, and it, and it measures uh, against our, our response time. Um, maybe one of our telephonic reporting unit uh, members can, can handle that uh, call for service over the phone, um, take the police report, issue a, a crime incident uh, report, be it for insurance or what have you, and then we could track it and assign it to investigations thereafter if there is, in fact, um, any investigative follow-up. That, that's just one example. I, I will share with you, you know, again, uh, dur during COVID, everything is uh, kind of a disclaimer here, right? Yeah. So the police academies closed. They closed. They didn't want outbreaks. Uh, you know, the state closed things down. And so what you know, we had, because of our hiring surge, we had, you know, 20 and 30 uh, recruits at various levels in the police academy, they run a, a freshman kind of college, freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior classes. All of those uh, folks had to come back to the police department for, for you know a, a couple of months. And so, what do what do you do with those folks? You can, you can continue to train them, and, and we did, uh, so that they wouldn't lose what they already learned when they get back in. They can pick up the ball, and keep going. But in part, what we did was we assigned those. Um, uh, Cadets recruits at that point, uh, some of them to our telephonic reporting unit, so they can take phone calls under the guidance of a supervisor, obviously, because they're still not a sworn peace officer. But we were able to provide alternative services to, again, um, assist in driving down those response times to appropriate calls that could be um, um, mitigated and handled over the phone. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I'm, well, I'm, try I'm trying to figure out, like, Hey, if I, if I, you know, and, and I'm not questioning that that's not the right thing to do. I'm just questioning how that comes into play in terms of the, um, the, the call response mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, if, you know, if, if uh, you know, if I submit an online re incident report or I just get the information just quickly over the phone, is that essentially like a five minute, you know, does that count as like a five minute response because it's done so quick for that priority four call? Well, it, it depends. Or, or, right? or is it excluded from, from because, you know, someone didn't really go out to the call? No, 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 no. It's all, it's all factored in. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all factored in. The other thing, you know, this, this kind of this misnomer of, well, no one, no one ever came. Right, and, and that's no, where right. I'm kind of going. <laughs> yeah. You can tell yeah, that, that, yeah. that can't be the case. And, and, I, and I talk to community members about this, um, you know, frequently. Um, in, in that you know, maybe there is a call for service and it, and it stays in the queue uh, and it does require an actual police officer to respond to the scene and because we're busy with other issues throughout the city um, you know that, that the response is delayed um, but we cannot we cannot remove the call um, mm -hmm. from 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 our, our, our service protocol that it has to be cleared by an officer if that's what it requires uh, a police response or a sergeant um, so some of this alternative response also uh, involved, um, you know, pick, because of COVID, not wanting to make in-person contact, the supervisors out in the field were encouraged to pick up the phone and call, right, and mm -hmm. say, okay, um, this verbal disagreement that you had with, you know, whomever, um, what are the issues? Um, and then assess if there's actually any policing uh, uh, factors or matters that need, that need to be addressed by the police. You know, another thing... That, that's part of the, you know, kind of the, the, the narrative here is, you know, what fits under police uh, responsibility.
responsibility, and then there's kind of everything else, right? So that alternative response is, is kind of meshed in here, if you will. So, so I mean, and, and where I guess I'm kind of driving is that, you know, because, I mean, you know, we, we all live in neighborhoods, and I mean, you, you live in a neighborhood also. Um, and yep. so, I mean, I, you know, I hear my neighbors say, you know, just, just like you said, oh, they never showed up. And it's like, well, I know they have to show up. It may not be in the, you know, you know it's not a priority one call. You know, so I'm not going to expect them to come, you know, life and violence. Um, right. So, you know, does, you know, because I know that, you know, so many of these are probably alternative police responses um, that needed. That, so does that, you know, do those four, you know, Internet call responses, do they hide the two, three-hour response to where we get to 27-minute average? Uh, no. Yeah. Okay. Because this, this does not apply. I mean, if we get... We get the call about you know, there's, a, there's a homeless guy or someone, some noise behind my house in the creek bed, let's say, right? That, that's not, we're, we're, we're not going to have that handle over the phone, obviously. We're going to send an officer. Uh, we'll probably send an airship, if one's a, I'm sorry, a police helicopter, <laughs> uh, to, to assist us uh, with that. That's also an alternative response, right? They can put eyes on pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, the other thing is in evaluating response times, uh, I, I must point out that um, some agencies, uh, they toll uh, their time from the moment that they actually dispatch the officer, send the officer, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, they don't know who the time in which the uh, resident uh, or, or calling uh, party, the person who made the call. These times factor when the person is actually calling. And then that call sits in our queue, depending on the priority, uh, and then the officer is dispatched if one is required and, and it's appropriate, and then once they conclude that, right, once they get there, all of that is part of our response plan. Uh, that's, so so that, 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 that's good. I think that was a question yeah. that Member Leo had last yeah. time, um, and so that's, that's great to know. Um, you could kind of pivot in a little bit, and it kind of goes into your, um, you know, kind of the... the the homeless type uh, issues. That, I mean, you and I have seen firsthand walking the creek bed. Um, but have we looked at, um, at, at alternative programs such as, you know, and like the one that is kind of uh, in the news right now is the Kahoot program up in Eugene. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, that uh, you know, respond to you know, especially the homeless homeless folks that uh, um, that are struggling with mental health issues that may not respond very well to. Mm -hmm. You know, someone trying to help them that might have a gun on their hip, you know, like our whole team and um, that, are, that are police officers. Have, are we you know, kind of exploring those programs? It, and maybe it's outside of the PD program, and I guess I'm uh, saying that. But, um, yeah, uh, great, great, great question. And, and again, part of the, you know, kind of the, the national uh, narrative uh, is what is the appropriate police response? Because right. I do agree with Tim that in some instances, for some folks, suffering a, a mental health crisis, seeing a uniformed police officer uh, with everything that they, you know, put on their bodies uh, can, can, you know, lead that interaction into a different direction. Uh, we, we are looking at various programs. We also partner with the county, uh, um, clinicians, city net. Uh, and, and, you know, our, our uh, response model is a de-escalation framework. Nothing that we... Uh, initiated uh, post George Floyd. This has been part of our training cadre for the last two years at a minimum, probably longer. Uh, we have a state of the art um, uh, training facility for decision making. It's a virtual piece. Um, it, is, it is the premier training platform in Orange County and it is uh, at, at the Santa Ana Police Department. So we, we uh, train to, to de escalation and you know, moving forward, that, that needs to actually continue to be a part of the conversation is, is what uh, does, um, you know, other alternative police response look like uh, for those instances, which, which is, is quite a few of, of, those, of those calls uh, that we've received. Um, we have had, uh, as a result, again, of the hiring um, and these two overarching goals and, and through support, uh, by Measure X, we have um, increased our quality of life uh, 
to deployment from in June of 2019, we had one full-time police officer assigned to the city. One. Right. So fast forward uh, to September of 2020. We're talking less than 18 months. Um, you go to one police sergeant, uh, which that unit you know, has never had a, a supervisor of that rank assigned full-time, and 10 police officers. That is a significant investment uh, in, in that area. And, and you know, the, the supervisor, for example, I will share with you, um, he is not, you know, someone who uh, was voluntold, if you will. He actually has a passion for this work. And so we look to see, make sure we have the right fit. Um, every police officer is not cut from the same mold. And so there are officers that, that really enjoy this work and connecting uh, folks that are that are suffering from mental health with, with you know resources and and supportive housing, et cetera. So so we have that, and the invest the investment is, is very clear, right? When you go from one one police officer doing this type of work to eleven, that's significant. Yeah, I, I would agree that that is significant. I just, I just um, you know, and obviously I'm talking to the chief here, so. You know, so the, you know, I, I take what I'm going to say, you know, in, in context. But I just question whether, uh, from my work with the homeless, whether mm -hmm. someone that with a badge and, more importantly, a, a gun on their hip, is the best response for, um, for you know, all, all, all of these, um, these these calls that, um, you know, maybe even after I think Sheriff Barnes said after the. Um, the 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 the, uh, the shooting of uh, Mr. Reinhold, you know, he, he had indicated that hey, the sheriffs really, you know, maybe they shouldn't be responding to all these. And so I, w I would encourage encourage you and the city to continue to work towards strategies that um, you know de escalation strategies that uh, may be, be a little bit better fit than a uh, um, and then. A, than an officer with the with the gun. Uh, Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I think that was all of my my kind of questions. Um, oh, well, I do have one comment that maybe <laughs> that totally unrelated to to any of this. Um, you know, we we have the um, we we all hear the helicopter quite often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and at certain times there are comments. That you know that they're on the loudspeaker, and mm -hmm. I understand. That I think some of this is outsourced to the sheriff. Um, but is there a way to? I mean, three quarters of the time, eighty percent of the time, maybe even higher, no one can understand what they're saying. And right. you know, we have this great thing, you know, social media out there, yeah. you know, or or even just a website that hey, can we you know log in and see just where hey, this is what the the helicopter is saying. Is is right. there is that something that that would be you know possible to do? Yeah, I I, um, I do have a, a social media uh, coordinator. Um, of course, these incidents that you're referring to, um, sometimes I would say, certainly, uh, comfortably I can say, or probably oftentimes occur after hours. And uh, the announcements that you're hearing are likely uh, regarding ongoing tactical uh, situations and or, believe it or not, missing people. Yeah, missing I, I, I would say adults, more than missing know. people that I'm concerned yeah. about. Yeah. Um, we, we can we can certainly look at um, you know uh, posting information uh, uh, possibly through our dispatch. Um, I, I will I will have staff uh, explore that. Understanding that you know these incidents oftentimes occur multiple times a day and at different you know different days of the week, et cetera. And and yeah, all all air support services are are contracted out. We we have no Santa Ana police owned. Um, right. You know, aircraft. Yeah, I just think I think it'd be helpful. on um, obviously not for your tactical calls that you're trying. To, is that, but but you know, hey, there's an 11 year old you know that we're looking for, and you're saying what color hoodie or you know, hat he had on last right. morning, what age, and that you know, that type of stuff is stuff that is important to the community. And right. you know, no one can tell what they're saying. So, but anyway, okay, I've I've uh, worn out my welcome. Um, so we still have others that would, I'm sure, would like to uh, to, to ask some questions. So, um, 
others, please uh, speak up. Hi, this is a uh, high chief volunteer, community member Perea. Um, Hello, how are you? Good, good. Thank you for your time and for for uh, for all the information that you you have provided to the committee. Um, mm -hmm. I have three questions. If you me, uh, the first one is a follow up on the uh, homeless uh, issue, um, and the other two are going to be relating to trust and quality of public safety. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first one relating to 9-11 calls, I'm just curious, um, you know, I think homelessness has become a, a, a very big uh, topic in, in, in Santa Ana, especially as, you know, the city struggles to, to figure out, you know, what are the best strategies. Um, but I'm curious to know out of the uh, total 9-11 calls, um, and this might be putting you around the spot, so I'm not sure you can provide that data, but out of the total of those 9-11 calls, Based on your estimate about how many or what is the percentage that of those calls that are related to homelessness um, incidents or issues? Um, but, uh, yeah, S specific 911 um, life-threatening calls related to homelessness. I don't have that data point uh, off, the, off the top of my head, but I but I certainly can can look to get that, and I can provide it to to Tim, and he can share it with the group. Thank you. And, and following up on that, if, if you could also provide the data, uh, you mentioned like threatening, right, but also the different, um, between those different priorities that you laid out in, in the information you provided, uh, how many of those calls you know, fall under each of those priorities? And it potentially also, in which, um, what are the zip codes right, or, where, or neighborhoods or areas where those calls also come in relating to homelessness as well? Thank you. The second question uh, on the I think, uh, 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 Member Prayer, I just want before I forget. Um, so, Chief, you shouldn't send anything to myself for me to share. Okay. Um, you'll want to share that with um, city staff, and then they can share it out um, uh, as a. As a Miss Catherine Downs is the big boss here, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So good, go ahead. Sorry, Rick. No, no. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the second question, and, and, and this is relating to, to the cost of police settlements to, to the city. Uh, I remember the last, uh, not sure if I remember correctly, but the last number that I saw was probably in 2017, where um, I saw there was a, a number that was thrown out that about $17 million uh, the city had paid towards uh, uh, settlements relating police misconduct or police incidents with residents over the last decade. Do you have any latest numbers uh, up to date of, on, on the last few years about how much money has the city paid towards those type of settlements? So again, um, I, I don't have those numbers. I can certainly um, get those from the city attorney's office, which is the appropriate uh, um, department that would that would have those data points and then provide them. So so let me just get this correct though. So you, you mentioned you saw a figure. Uh, in 2017 from the 10 years prior, what you're asking for is data for the past 10 years, so 2010 to 2020? Correct. Yeah, so we can, once again, look at to see what those uh, what those figures are and provide them uh, to Mrs. Downs. Thank you. And on that as well, if, if it can also be broken down by year, uh, just to see, you know, what has been the progression year over year. Sure, sure. Makes sense. And then lastly, the third question, which I'm not sure also you're going to have the data on, <laughs> but uh, will the number of, of, of citizen complaints uh, of police officers uh, of the last year as well, broken down by year? So uh, I actually do have that, not in oh. front of me, because I'd have to exit out of this Zoom, and I don't want to get lost. But if you go to our police department website, there is a, a tab, Open Government, uh, that uh, did not exist there uh, before I took over as chief, you're going to find a couple different pieces there. First, you're going to find um, our calls for service volume, um, month to month, average year. You're going to find the number of citizen complaints uh, there as well. You're going to, you're going to find the um, different classifications of uh, citizen complaint findings. Um, you're also going to find the protocol on officer-involved shootings and in-custody deaths. Um, I, I, I 
highlight that piece, something that you will not find um, in many, many police departments, forward-facing information like that. Um, on, the, on the assistant complaints, I, the data point there is at least three years, if not five years. Okay. Pretty fine. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's, definitely, that's definitely something that um, many people don't have, so I, so I appreciate that, that sure. information. And that will be all for my Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Anyone else wants to speak up? Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Hey, this is uh, Commissioner Lugo, Chief. Um, yes, sir. Quick question for you. I think this would be pretty simple, but I think you just you put, you touched on it when you were discussing it. But I was really curious to hear a little bit more details on how the time response is um, closed. In other words, from the point it started to the time it is considered, you know, a response has been given, meaning the end of the clock of the shot clock or the clock. Mm -hmm. uh, does the police officer do that manually or is that automatic? So, great question. So, uh, from the time that the dispatcher receives the phone call and he or she is collecting information um, uh, until that person assigns an officer and that officer goes on scene. As soon as the officer arrives on scene, um, there's a uh, button that they can push uh, on their, on their uh, computer. Um, or they can, you know, manually get on the radio and say, I'm, I'm, I'm here, and that stops the clock. This is just response time now, right? Because right. the call itself could take, you know, our six-minute response, could, you know, if it's a fatality, we'll be there for hours. But, yeah, that, from, from the time we get the call in, and then usually the officer will hit a, um automatic button, which sends a signal that the officer is on scene. Let me, let me ask this question. You know, technology has really advanced a lot. Yes. You know, over the, the few years, let alone the last decade or so, has there ever been any consideration to having that uh, clock stopped automatically using technology, GPS arriving at the location? So we do we do have a GPS capability, and so the dispatcher has that all available. So um, where it automatically registers an officer going on scene without having to push the button or make some sort of um, um, forward action, if you will. Um, I, I don't know that we have that in place today. Um, I can certainly check, but uh, the, the dispatcher has a full view. Uh, even if the officer doesn't push the button 97, uh, I'm sorry, on scene, they, they can see where all their units are. Um, but it, it, it's, it's a good question that, that, I, that I will follow up on. Uh, thank you, Chief. Yes. All right, is there anyone else uh, would like to, to uh, ask the chief anything, or are we, we ready to move on? We haven't heard from everyone yet, so. This is Member Landaverde. I don't have any questions, just wanted to say thank you for the presentation. Um, I feel like my questions were basically answered with everyone else asking the same questions, so um, just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is Member, Member Lewis, I concur. Thank you very much, and very informational. Thank you. Okay, uh, perfect. Uh, Chief, I, I really appreciate it on behalf of the entire um, uh, committee here uh, and the residents in general. Also, I appreciate you taking the time and, and putting your uh, putting your best uniform on for us, even though we can't see it. <laughs> you got them. <laughs> so, but uh, I much appreciate it, and uh, um, please pass along our, all of our thanks to, uh, to, to, to everyone that uh, um, it goes on the streets for us every day, so thank you. Will do. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, perfect. Um, and uh, so next would be item number four on our agenda, um, which would be um, Parks and Rec um, Community Services. Um, and so is uh, uh, Director Rudolph with us? So, uh, Kristen, I can... Lisa, are you there? I'm sorry, Tim. Sorry. Yep. Sorry, having... Um, 
Yes, I am. I'm trying to load the PowerPoint. Give me one second here. Okay. Are you able to see the PowerPoint? Yes, so we is, do. Uh, Jeff Johnson and yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Well, good evening, Chair um, Johnson and Vice Chair Landoverdi and members of the MeasureX uh, Oversight Committee. I'm pleased to be here this evening. My name is Lisa Rudloff. I'm the Executive Director of the Parks, Recreation, and Community Services Agency. And with me tonight is Frank Arroyo. He is our Senior Management Analyst. So tonight I'm here to provide you information regarding the Measure X impacts on our agency and specifically I will share how these uh, allocations are helping to improve the quality of life for our residents in providing for youth and seniors and maintaining our park system. In fiscal year 2019-20, the Measure X funding allocation received was over $4.7 million for park maintenance contracts, park, zoo, and library staff, and tree care. And since then, we've made some changes in our ex uh, expenditures due to the pandemic, uh, which resulted also in a hiring freeze. So some of the expenditures represent an increase in spending from fiscal year 2018-19 such as the park and zoo maintenance contracts and tree care. And uh, in addition, due to that hiring freeze, staff funding was used for capital improvements uh, and other needs in our department specific to Measure X funding uh, parameters. And I'll share with you some of those uh, projects here. Okay, sorry about that. Let's go back to the senior center. Um, we are taking advantage of this time due to the pandemic uh, to renovate both of our senior centers. The Southwest Senior Center is almost completed and the Santa Ana Senior Center uh, is uh, about halfway finished. Um, both of the centers will receive new roofs, floors, painting on the inside and outside of the buildings, uh, new cabinets, kitchen and equipment. We've updated the restrooms, uh, provided brand new furniture and chairs. Um, we've um, also completed some walkway, walkway repairs. A lot of the walkway around the senior centers, which was very dangerous for our seniors, was buckling, and so those have been fixed, and also we've updated the landscaping. Um, these, these senior centers are really utilized on a daily basis um, by our seniors, and they were in desperate need of renovation. So in the pictures, you can see that uh, this is the Southwest Senior Center, and um, we have painted the uh, inside and outside uh, the gray color, and we're going to do the same for the Santa Ana Senior Center. And you'll see the new floors and the furniture uh, and the beautiful kitchen. And um, I cannot wait until we open uh, because our seniors are going to be blown away, and they're just going to, to love this beautiful building. Next is um, our park tree care. Uh, which is primarily uh, for tree trimming services throughout our park system. And this slide shows the trimming at the Southwest Senior Center, Thornton Park, uh, Centennial Park, and the Santa Ana Zoo. Um, our tree care budget increased from 50000 annually to 250000 um, However, we've already blown through that. <laughs> and um, it's, you know, only the first quarter. Uh, of the year. So we have a lot of backlog uh, maintenance uh, regarding our trees um, and it's very critical for our trees to be taken care of uh, because they've, you know, it's for the safety of our patrons. We don't want any tree branches uh, falling on anyone. Um, the tree planting, we don't really do tree planting. We have some wonderful volunteers that do that. Uh, for example, the Orange County Conservation Corps just um, planted uh, over 200 trees in uh, Lily King Park, Sandpoint Park, Saddleback View Park, Delhi Park, and the Pacific Electric Bike Trail. So these folks will come in and provide the trees, provide um, uh, the staffing to um, um, put the trees in the, in the ground, and um, other volunteer organizations like People in Trees and Stanbridge University uh, we'll also find volunteers to come and do uh, the work. So we really appreciate what they do, and it really helps with um, replenishing our tree stock. Uh, 
Next is, pardon me, on the slides here. Uh, next is painting and improvements uh, that we have been doing. Um, I'm sorry, painting and fence and gate installation. Um, we have had some painting improvements at Jerome Park Concession Building and the Salgado Community Center. Uh, we've painted the inside of the community center, and we've also replaced the floors. Um, some of our fence installations have been at the uh, Santa Ana Zoo. In the very front of the zoo, there now is turnstiles at the front gate. And uh, this is a tre tremendous improvement to help you know, secure the access to the zoo and allow one person at a time to pass through without, you know, with, with a ticket. And before, people could just walk through um, easily, and it was hard to keep track. So we have some great turnstiles put in. We also um, have the Jerome Ball uh, Field Fencing. If you see the uh, middle picture on the top, uh, top middle with the black um, vinyl coated black fencing, we're replacing all of our cyclone fencing uh, whenever we have funds available with this black coated uh, fencing. And uh, it's, it's uh, really a great improvement. It looks really good. Um, we also have installed a fence at Centennial Park. Uh, the picture on the very right top the blue fence around where the water is, the lake is. Um, this never had a fence, and the playground, the kids who used the playground uh, could just fall in. <laughs> so we uh, put that uh, gate in, and it's much more safe for our kids when they use that. Um, in addition, we installed um, parking lot gates at um, about 60% of our parks. And uh, this is helpful so we can lock up our gates at night when the park closes. Uh, we'll have our park security or our park ambassadors lock the gates. Next, <laughs> next is our sports field uh, and park security lighting. Um, we will complete um, uh, retrofit uh, projects at Jerome and Rosita Parks and the Santa Ana Stadium. We're actually not taking the lights down. We're changing the uh, metal halide bulbs to the high efficiency LED lights. And this really makes for a better, safer um, uh, football field, soccer field, baseball field, uh, and for our participants. Um, we also will be replacing the light poles and the uh, light fixtures at Riverview Park. The light poles actually are wood, and those are very dangerous. So we have that in the budget, and we'll be doing that this year. Um, and then we will also be... Um, well, actually, when funding allows, we need to replace the um, light poles and the lights at Memorial and Thornton Parks in the future. Uh, and lastly on this slide is the, um, the flag poles. Um, we, have, we are installing 21 flag poles without lights uh, with new flag poles, uh, and they have solar-powered lights. And simply, this is just to honor the American flag and fly it 24 hours a day with the proper illumination uh, during all hours of darkness. The next slide is in regards to pool renovation and cement repairs. Uh, we have renovated all of our pools uh, that are located at Jerome, El Salvador, Memorial, Salgado, and Santa Anita Parks. Um, the pools are really beyond their useful life, and, uh, you know, in the future we need to replace them. Um, however, we don't have funding, so we do the best we can by uh, fixing the, um, the coping and the walkways around the pool and the interior of the lights. Um, but that's something we'll need to address definitely in, in the future. And then the other two pictures are um, the... Um, uh, walkway at Lily King Park. Um, it was the uh, broken uh, and lifted sidewalk, so we're trying to go through and we're trying to repair and replace those type of uh, items. Uh, the next slide is the park exercise equipment, and we've installed fitness courts, uh, which is on the left. Um, at Jerome, Del High, and Rosita Parks with our Measure X funding. And we are installing two additional fitness courts at El Salvador and Cabrillo Parks uh, with the Cannabis Public Benefit Funds. Uh, and we're going to be doing that in the next uh, probably couple months. Those should be completed. Um, and these fitness courts are 
uh, in cooperation with the National Fitness Campaign, uh, which we are a part of, uh, to help provide free fitness opportunities to our community. Um, it, it's very important that we provide these opportunities because Santa Ana is in the top three of the highest obesity rates in Orange County, and, and that's not the top three we want to be in. So we want to continue to provide these opportunities for the public to utilize so they don't have to go to and pay for a gym membership. They can go to their park, they can get some exercise and get healthy. Um, the two pictures on the right are um, fitness equipment. Um, this is at the Maple and Occidental. It's a linear park. Um, and this is uh, new equipment, uh, and it is heavily used every day. There were some super old equipment, so we, um, it was unsafe, um, so we took that down and replaced it with this new equipment. Um, the majority of our park restrooms are in despicable conditions. <laughs> And so we are replacing restrooms with prefabricated buildings, and we're designing them very purposefully, um, and they include graffiti coating on the building, auto door locks, auto lights inside. We also are designing them with a two to four inch opening at the bottom of the doors. Um, the sinks are on the outside of the building, uh, and they will have auto shutoffs of the water uh, when the park closes. Um, and these restrooms are really a great improvement uh, for the community to use. The photo on the left is the Santa Ana Zoo bathroom renovation, and on the right is the restroom at Delhi Park. We are almost finished replacing the restrooms, uh, uh, the restroom at Thornton Park. Um, in addition, we're also replacing restrooms at Campesino, Memorial, and Madison Parks, and we're utilizing CDBG funding for those. Next, uh, we are systematically replacing our park uh, signs uh, throughout our system, our park system. And the signs on the slide uh, include the Pat McGuin um, Skate Park, um, which is at Centennial Park. Um, and there is also an interpretive sign at Thornton Park next to that. There is an entry sign at the Saddleback View Park. And then there are park rule signs that we're installing throughout our park system. We're making sure that we're um, um, providing those in two languages. This picture um, is about some new equipment that we were able to purchase. And on the left is a new freezer uh, for the Santa Ana Zoo to keep uh, the food um, for the animals. And also for the Santa Ana Zoo is an x-ray uh, machine. Uh, this, is, um, this is brand new and it is very helpful to staff. Um, this, this machine, you can actually um, develop the film, and the old way, uh, was, uh, we had to um, uh, get the film developed. Uh, so this is a very quick process. It's updated. You can manipulate the pictures, and, um, and that's what's important. Uh, and so we we're able to uh, care for our animals. And the next slide is uh, we've done some roof repairs. Uh, this is the Santa Ana Zoo office. We've also replaced the roofs at the Santa Ana Senior Center and the Southwest Senior Center. Some of our general park improvements include landscape enhancements, um, lake aeration, and stream uh, renovations. Our parks are really, really looking beautiful now. They've had some time to to grow uh, during the uh, pandemic where people are not utilizing them that much. Uh, and so we're very happy about that. We do have some issues with our lakes uh, at Centennial and Thornton Lake. Uh, they really need some major renovations. Um, they're, they're leaking. Um, we have fish that are floating to the top and dying. Uh, they're really need, in need of some renovation. And uh, that's a big ticket item, but we need to um, address that in the future, and that cost uh, for both of those is anywhere between 1.5 million and 2.5 million. Um, so we just need to keep that in mind as we're um, renovating our parks. Um, similar to the tree planting, we also have volunteers that help with plants. Um, for example, we had a group of volunteers uh, at Willard Park um, plant 
at our entry. Um, they provide the volunteers. They provide the plants, and and we're very, very grateful and thankful that they do that. And lastly, um, our agency needs to focus on uh, really some ongoing funding for the future for our contract services, um, our staffing, and our park maintenance. Um, it's, it's critical to have our contracts for landscaping, ball diamonds, pest control, and fertilization. Uh, and when these contracts were awarded, there was enough money in, in fiscal year 1920 to cover the increased cost. However, the additional funding for 2021 um, is needed. And so what we're doing to make that up is we're cutting in other areas. Um, but, but we really need to uh, address this in the future to make sure that we are covering our, our funding for our contracts. This is critical to me because the community, when I, when I go out into the community, they want parks that are safe, they want parks that are clean, they want parks that are well maintained, and that is where we are focusing, and uh, this is where we need to make some uh, improvements in the future. And lastly, the funding for the implementation of the uh, parks, facilities, trails, and open space master plan will be needed. This next fiscal year, we're going to be um, creating our parks master plan and of that we're going to have an implementation of uh, the results of that plan so we will need some funding in the future for that. Um, that is the end of my presentation and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Excellent, thanks uh, Lisa. <clears throat> those, uh, those pictures are uh, Make, it, make me proud of, uh, proud of the parks, and I can hear it in your voice that you are, are also. Absolutely. Uh, so, so uh, members, do we have uh, any questions or comments uh, for Director Rudolph? This is Member Leo. Um, first of all, congratulations. Um, you came to us about a year ago, said you were going to do some stuff, and you did a lot of stuff, and uh, as a resident, I'm greatly appreciative of that work. Second of all, you mentioned you. about some budget stuff, and one yeah. of the things that um, Commissioner uh, Perea has asked about is youth services and youth programs. Right. And one of the things is, is that the parks have lots of programs but also need maintenance. And yeah. so one of the things I would suggest, at least going forward, at least for the next year, knowing that we don't know what the fallout's going to be from COVID. We don't know what the sales tax, we don't know what any of it's going to look like. One of the things we do know is that the marijuana tax fund has at least $3 million, and Catherine can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but about $3 million for, for youth services and youth right. programs. That is a place where I think parks and recs and the youth groups can get together and figure out how to use that, that $3 million effectively and maybe get us over the hump through the, through the downturn of, the, of COVID, assuming we're not going to see real stuff, real back to normalcy, quasi-normalcy, until May or June of next year. So I point you in that direction as you were talking about asking, looking for funds. That right. is something where I think the Parks and Recs Commission and the Youth Commission can get together and talk about what could we do at least in the interim. But thanks for the good work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Also, um, just for your information, um, every uh, three months um, I report out on the use of cannabis public uh, benefit funds for youth services. And the last time I did that was on September 15, 2020. And so you'll see a variety of programs and services for youth um, that are offered by the library, Parks and Recreation, and Parks and Recreation. Um, and also we've taken the Youth Commission, uh, their input, and um, definitely in the future we'll uh, continue to um, seek the input of the Youth Commission as well as the Park and Rec Commission for those type of items. But um, no, that's great. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right, so I'll, I'll ask a question. This is, uh, this is Tim. Um, Lisa, uh, again, congratulations on, on doing a great job with the, with the limited uh, uh, budget that you have. Um, Thank you. I mean, I think it, it's, it's, 
you're a hundred percent right in terms of uh, you know people want to have nice parks. They want to be able to go use them. Uh, so I appreciate the devotion that you have towards that. Um, and as I'm uh, uh, congratulating you, I forgot my question. Um, oh, I, I, I know what it was now. <laughs> um, um, the uh, the park uh, security program. Yes. Um, is that um, I believe that that was a um, kind of a, a trial, if I remember right. Um, is can you give an update on where we are with that? Is it working to your satisfaction? Do you, do you see it going in a different direction? Um, Yes, certainly. The uh, the park security program is continuing on. That was funded in the budget, and we we still have our officers, uh, park security officers, um, patrolling our um, parks, and uh, they are augmenting or helping. Um, you know, the police department. If there's if there are any issues, um, they call the police department if they need help. Um, they're kind of a report, observe and report. Um, I think it is uh, critical in this um, community to have eyes on the park, our parks, as much as possible. We also have a park ambassador program, uh, which helps to also have some eyes on the park. Um, they're, they're essentially city employees that drive around and check on permitted activities in the parks. Um, however, they fill out reports and they turn it in and they will um, provide information on the app with they see graffiti or inappropriate things happening in the park, they'll call uh, the police department. So um, so I definitely think that the uh, park security is a good thing and it's continuing to um, help us. You know, they can't cite, uh, but they certainly can, you know, like I say, call the police department when needed. Um, another thing I'd like to mention that we're going to do is a park host program. So we're going to have a park host program, which is a person who lives at the park 24-7. Uh, they're not on duty 24-7, but they're kind of a conduit to the community. And um, they um, are also someone who can help folks with the park rules and um, just be a friendly face. And um, we're going to try this at Thornton Park. And we're just about ready to launch the program, and we're seeking um, people who want to to do that, and they, they live in a fifth wheel or an RV. Um, we allow them to live at the park for free, and uh, in exchange for that, they have you know hours that they'll work and they'll walk the park, and um, they wear vests. They'll have a park host sign, and so we'll also do a big media um, marketing uh, splash on this uh, before it takes off. So that's something else we're, we're doing to help um, help our parks and facilities. Well, that that uh, program uh, sounds sounds sound good. Uh, I wonder if they're going to sell firewood, like uh, when you're out camping or not. But <laughs> um, <laughs> are, is that, so, is that? I mean, from a funding perspective, is that a paid position, or are they essentially kind of volunteering and or in exchange of having a um, you know essentially a you know a place to uh, to, to kind of uh, stay stay for lack of a better term? But is right. that, or, or are they on salary or no? It it is not a paid position. In exchange for their volunteering, uh, they are allowed to live uh, at, at the park. We provide their electricity um, and any kind of, um, uh, probably we're going to give them a cell phone and, and any other kind of equipment to do their job. And so um, it's, it's done in other agencies. Yeah. Uh, it's similar to the state parks also. They have park hosts. Right. Um, and so, um, yeah, so we'll see how that works out in Santa Ana and uh, uh, it's like I said, it's a pilot, and looking forward to to starting that. Well, yeah, that that, that sounds great. I think having some continuity of you know at, at the park is uh, you know that's what I think a lot of people think back to like the park rangers. They kind of you know started to know their ranger, uh, right. you know, and their rounds and stuff. And so that would I think that would help contribute to that. So that's great. Right. All right, guys. Uh, who, who who else? Uh, um, anyone else have a, a any, any questions or, or or comments for Parks and Rec here? Um, this is Member Landa Verde. Um, Lisa, thank you so much for the presentation. I, everything looks amazing, like just from what you guys showed us. So great job on that. Um, thank you. I have a question on. I know you mentioned for um, Thornton Park or like the lakes. Um, was yes. that the funding that you were talking about just for the lakes, or is it just the parks? Those parks in general that needed that 1.5 to 2.5 million. 
Yeah, the the um, we we had some aeration that we did to both of the um, Centennial and Thornton Park, but that's not enough. We need to totally renovate, so we need to seek funding to uh, Thornton Park uh, Lake will take about 1.5 million, and the Centennial Lake will take about 2.5 million. So we haven't identified funding. We've applied for many grants, but we've not received them because it's a maintenance thing, and there's not maintenance grants out there. So we're going to have to figure out some way to uh, find some money to, to re renovate those lakes. Um, okay. Um, thank you for that. Do you know how like far into the future? I know you mentioned um, that this is like a future project. And the only reason I'm asking, too, is just because I live near Thornton Park, and I've walked to that park, and that mm -hmm. lake smells so gross. Like it, it is disgusting. It's <laughs> like, so disgusting. Like, it's not even – you want to go walk, and it's like it's, – it's an unbearable – and I mean, I – I mean, I know there's kids that go out and play in there and everything, but, oh, man, it's, it's bad. So I yeah. guess it's like just an idea. Do you know if, like, how far into the future you guys are looking to do this renovation? Or? Well, it's it's not – as soon as I could find the funding. Okay. <laughs> so so it's going to be a it's gonna be a while. Uh, if, we, if we find some funding, uh, we certainly would um, fast-track it uh, to the top of the list. But in the meantime, we're going to try to keep it as clean as possible and keep it repaired and aerated, but I understand what you're saying. The, the lake is, is very smelly, and there was a point there was fish floating up to the top, and we try to get out there. We clean those uh, out as, as quick as we can. So um, it's, it's on our mind, and it's on our list, so I promise that we'll, we'll try to get it fixed. Awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah, I saw what you guys did with everything else, so looking forward to seeing what that would bring to the future for these other parts. Great. There's one more thing for Thornton Park i got to tell you about. We are going to be putting in some splash pads or some splash parks uh, throughout our park system, and Thornton Park is one of those. So you'll, you'll see um, a great water activity at the park here soon. Hey, hey Lisa, this is Tim again. Um, yes. You know, in, in, in regards to the um, grants, uh, I know that when... Um, and I think this goes through parks, but there's a grant for, I think, um, it might be called the a tri well, Triangle Park off of 17th Street, right at the riverbed. Yes. And when, when the city was applying for that, I received an email saying, hey, can you write a letter, um, you know, supporting this? And you know, because I, you know, expressed some support for it before. Um, yes. do, you know, do, um, and that letter went off to, I think, the grant, you know, to someone in government, not the city, but, you know, someone higher that was, you know, making the decision on that. Um, right. Do those, you know, is that something that we, that is helpful when you're trying to get grant funding to have, you know, just uh, regular residents write, you know, letters of support, you know, similar to like a public comment at a city council meeting, um, you know, when, or uh, I'm just curious if that, if that would be, you know, because I, I feel that like we're going to probably start relying upon these grants pretty heavily right. uh, for, for a lot of this stuff um, to where, you know, are we able to get, you know, better um, uh, uh, responses from, from from those grants if we, you know, engage the community. Absolutely. Some of the grants require uh, community engagement, and they want to, uh, you know, know what the community thinks and do they support it. Um, the neighborhood associations have been great in writing letters uh, as we've applied for our prop the Proposition 68 grants, which we've received quite a bit of money uh, through those. But... Yeah, um, um, any kind of uh, neighborhood association or citizens or um, anyone who will help us out and write letters of support, we, we definitely add those to our uh, grant applications. Okay, um, I, I would suggest that, I mean, that's the only time that I've, has been, I've been involved with that, and I feel like I kind of have my pulse on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, my, my, my comment would be that let's make sure we're engaging the um, you know, community as much as possible for that because I think there's a lot of people, especially with parks, um, that will, you know, they they have your passion also for it and they're going to be right alongside you um, um, supporting it, but we just need to know what, what we need to do sometimes. Absolutely. Thank you. we Will do. Okay, sorry for steal, stealing whoever was going to speak next. So <laughs> go ahead, uh, anyone. Hey, this is Member Lugo. I just wanted to say thank you, Lisa. You're doing a great job. Anything you need from us, how we could support you. Like um, Tim you. said, 
you know, just reach out. We awesome. Have that is awesome. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. And this is Member Liz. I'm, I'm new to the committee, but I wanted to just thank you very much for your presentation. It was very, very informative. So thank you. Thank you. This is Member Caragos, and I second that. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think that is, everyone's kind of chimed in, I think. So, um, so Lisa, on behalf of you know, the, the committee and, you know, on behalf of just the residents in general, uh, uh, thank you for all your hard work with, uh, you know, a kind of strange year. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and ho hopefully we can keep the maintenance of these great uh, structures and pictures that you showed us um, up o over the uh, over the coming years uh, because I'm sure that they're going to get used and appreciated um, in, in that time. So uh, thank you very much for, um, for, for giving us an update and uh, getting me excited to get out, out of my office and into uh, some of these parks. <laughs> awesome. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I think we are at the end of our business calendar. And so if there's anyone that's hanging on that wants to make a, a, a public comment um, on non-agenda type items or even as agenda item as chair, I would, I would allow that to, to, to happen. Um, at, the, at this moment, so staff, are there, is there anyone queued up at all that uh, has hung with us for the past uh, almost two hours now? We do have a caller on the line. Um, all right. Caller uh, with the last four digits of 1412, please dial um, star six to speak. Hi. It's Keith. Hi, it's Keith Carpenter. Hi, Keith. Can, can you guys hear me? It's, it's breaking up a little bit on my end, so hopefully you can uh, you can hear me on your end. Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Yeah, a couple a uh, couple comments. Uh, first of all, on the parks, I mean, you can't help but praise what they've done with the little amount of funding they've had, and the the important part of that is how much good that really does the community, and I think that's too often overlooked that the little little bit of money at the bottom can really help things out and really help the people, create pride in the city, it helps reduce crime and all those things for money well spent and again not very much of it. So my, my recommendation to the committee is to really, really, really lobby hard uh, to the council for additional money for the Parks and Rec because again we can all see I can hear the excitement in everybody's voice as they're commenting how much good it's done and how how, how much better it makes the city so I'd lo strongly urge you to do that um, other than that I had some questions for the police officer uh, the, I'm sorry the police commander but I, I suppose he's, he's long gone by now uh, but yeah that was about it um, the only other thing I was curious about is the oversight committee for the police, if that, what the uh, progress on that was. Um, and again, that's something I think Measure X money could be used for, because I know that was a little bit of a point of contention. So yeah, those are my comments. Again, more money for the parks and recs. It does everybody a whole lot of good. And um, just follow up on that oversight committee for the police. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, uh, Mr. Carpenter, for your feedback. Um, and continued involvement. Um, Kristen, do we have any other uh, other callers? No, that was it. Thank you. All right, excellent. Um, and so I think at this time we are at um, staff, uh, staff comments. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And we have nothing to share. Thank you. All right, excellent. Um, I, actually, a real quick, uh, um, would you be able to we'll just remind everyone what our next meeting is? Because I don't think we adjourned to to a meeting, right? We uh, just so yeah, everyone you, knows on calendar. Adjourn, yeah, you do adjourn to. Uh, I believe it's December 9th. Is that okay. correct, Kristen? Yes, that is correct. Got it. Okay. I. I yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Well, um, so uh, member uh, staff member comments are done. So at this time, um, 
So let's go around and do um, many member comments. Um, so let's, uh, 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 member Lugo, do you want to start? Um, sure. I just, uh, you know, what, what comes to mind is um, the time period that we're in right now, the challenges that we've all had. I just uh, uh, like to say everybody keep your head up. Uh, definitely vote and encourage those people around you to vote. And I do appreciate the team that um, comprises, you know, this uh, committee, um, all the support staff and uh, those people that come and present to us. Um, thank you very much, and I look forward to continue to serve the city and um, work with you guys to help the city grow into a much better city than it is today. Excellent. How about uh, Member Leo? Uh, I just wanted to congratulate the commission as a whole. I thought the two presentations tonight from the police chief and from the Parks and Recs folks pretty much followed what we hoped they would follow which is last year we tried to set standards and to come with, come to us with answers and both departments came to us with answers and progress and needs. So I think I want everybody who has been on the commission since the beginning and, and our new folks that I think we set the standard and I think it's working and I look forward to hearing from the other departments as we go forward because now that we're in this process of educating the public on what we're spending the money on, I think it's, um, I think the work that we did early on has really helped us as we go forward. So um, thanks to everybody and um, welcome our newest commissioner. Excellent. Um, how about uh, Member Perea? I definitely, uh, definitely echo what everyone's been saying. I uh, was very pleased uh, from today's presentations and the overall progress that has been made. Um, and definitely everyone in this committee. I um, feel so that everyone in this committee ha cares deeply about the city and obviously for the best uh, the city can do and, and for residents. So I'm um, definitely looking forward to the next meeting. Excellent. And Member Perez, oh my goodness. Um, Member Lori Karaguzian. Oh goodness, I'm sorry. Thank you. I, no I worries. Closed. <laughs> Not a problem at all. Um, I also want to thank the police chief and uh, the executive director of Parks and Rec for being with us tonight. Their presentations were very informative and shedding light on some of these things that we had and they answered all our questions. So great to be here. Happy to serve. Uh, looking forward to our next meeting. Thank you. Excellent. And, uh, and our newest member, Member Lewis. I want to thank everyone for the warm welcome and also the informative presentations that we had today. Um, I have to say that I've looked at the previous uh, submission or presentation to the council last year, and I agree with Commissioner Leo that the um, standards that the committee have set, um, based upon what I heard from both um, Executive Director Rudolph and the Police Chief, um, it really, you know, sort of borne itself out in um, what's been uh, done with the funding measure funding thus far. So I look forward to, again, help to helping to contribute to that progress and contribute ideas and, um, and to serve the people of Santa Ana. So thank you for welcoming me, and thank you very much. Excellent. And Vice Chair Landa Verde. I just second um, everything Member Leo said. I mean, he pretty much said it, <laughs> I think, the way we all feel. So um, I'm glad to be part of this committee and just look forward to many more to come. Excellent, thanks. And I'm, I'll, I'll uh, second, third, and fourth uh, everyone's comments and uh, just uh, appreciate um, staff's hard work and in, in, in putting this together. And most especially because I mean we have to realize that this is a, a special special meeting, and uh, you know so it's above and beyond what they're normally doing. So I appreciate them taking the time to coordinate all this. Um, and um, you know the, the these these meetings tend to t tend to, to run a little long. Uh, and uh, but I think they're very informative. Um, you know, we, we obviously have an election on Tuesday, and this group may be changing. You know, not at our next meeting in December, but uh, but uh, at some point. But I you know appreciate everyone. The first uh, you know this is the first generation of of, of this uh, committee, 
and I think we we're setting the tone for for uh, for future uh, for future members. Um, uh, also, if there's any if there's any changes, hopefully uh, hopefully there's not because I think we've got a good group going here. Uh, but uh, thanks to, uh, to to staff for the hard work as well as for uh, for, for Chief the Chief Valentine and, and the Executive Director Rulof for and and the people the folks that help them with their presentations. Um, it's much appreciated. I know the community appreciates it also. Um, so with that, um, I would adjourn our meeting to our next regular meeting of the Major Act Citizen Oversight Committee um, is scheduled for December 9th of 2020 at 6 p.m. Um, whether that's telephonic or in room 1600 of, of 20 Civic Center Plaza, or not, but uh, one of the two. Um, I hope to see everyone uh, safe or hear everyone safe at that time. Um, so, uh, with that, I think we're done unless staff, uh, unless I've missed anything. No, you haven't. Thank you so much, Chair Johnson. Good meeting, everybody. Thank you. All right, appreciate it. Thank good night, you. everyone. Have a good night.